This idea mainly uh, can be expressed in the same way. If I autonomously act, and I should also buy accept the consequences of my action, if in a way I can foresee what those consequences are. But what we are saying there is that we actually go for the second solution. There might be cases in which people voluntarily self exclude themselves or seclude themselves, but those cases do not count as cases of autonomous choice. In the end, we, why? Because people, of course, need to, uh, in order to act, need to act voluntarily. But not all, ca all cases of voluntary action is a case in which one can be a responsibility for the consequences of their choices. Uh, there are many cases in which people may act under cases of, say, duress, stress, even social duress, which is, of course, a, a way of acting voluntarily, but not autonomously. So, um, our view so is the following. There are some forms of injustice that impinge on the way people make choices, voluntary choices, of course, which are, uh, nonetheless undermine their autonomy. And these forms of injustice are revealed by cases in which exclusionary conduct is framed within a coercive scheme of structural prejudice. Uh, what are these forms of justice then? So our uh, hypothesis is that the specific form of injustice that affect, say, education in the way people make their choices with regard to their educational opportunities are epistemic form of injustice. Now, to uh, those of you that were present here and uh, in the previous conference, you will be already, of course, um, familiar with the idea of epistemic injustice. This, um, what you want to say with regard to epistemic injustice is the idea that some attitudes that people develop in self-excluding themselves may be prompted by the fact that they lack some important epistemic resources that will enable them to make an autonomous choice, to consider, for instance, the possible alternatives in terms of different path of, uh, uh, path of life, but even to give actually significance to the kind of choices they make. Um, I will just actually pass you know, the word uh, to uh, Manoir, which will uh, deal into this uh, aspect of epistemic injustice more in detail. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Daniele. So, uh, this part, I, I'll not so much uh, talk about this part of epistemic injustice because Krasimir actually gave us a very good account of what uh, the both forms of testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice, which Fricker actually talks about in her book. But uh, here I'll j generally just, just give you a brief account of what hermeneutical injustice is because this is very important for what we are talking about in this paper, at least in the context of bound to fail attitude. Now, hermeneutical injustice especially occurs, as Krasmir also mentioned, is when, when a gap in collective in interpretive resources puts somewhere, someone at an unfair disadvantage when it comes to making sense of their social experiences. So basically, the example as he gave, like, you know, sexual exploitation in the workplace, like if you do not have this concept of exploitation, you'll neither be able to make sense of your own experience, but like you cannot even communicate it to the other. And even the oppressor sometimes does not feel that there is a wrong actually being done to, to somebody. So, so it seems that at, at a conceptual level, we do not have a concept of wrong. But um, so what hermeneutical injustice does, it, it potentially renders the subject incapable of making sense of their own social experience. But, uh, but the part that we are interested in, and that's why we focus on hermeneutical injustice, here, uh, here in, in the case of hermeneutical injustice, it's the lack of the concept. But what we are saying is there might be some times where the, both the person who's being oppressed and the oppressor, like you know, in that case, might just have the conceptual resource, but at least the oppressed person cannot interpret their own condition being governed by that concept, say for example. And that's why it's, it's important that, you know, like even what Aman was saying, that sometimes even people coming from marginalized communities buy into this concept of, say, merit, but, but they do not see that they are actually entering into an unfair competition when there is a structural prejudice in place. So, so uh, sometimes what they might actually feel that, you know, it's, it's they themselves who are to blame for their failure, but it might be that their failure results from a structural prejudice and not because of their own actions or like, or so they are not responsible for their own actions in that sense. So then that's where we need to refine what this bound to fail attitude 
means because it needs to include this idea of like how can we misrecognize the sources of our own oppression or like sources of our own failures and blame ourselves for for that failure rather than like looking at as something which emerges from a structure or like something which is outside our control so uh, then a bound to fail attitude is is the practical disposition to expect that one's attempts to accomplish a life plan are doomed to fail and blame oneself for a given failure when, when it occurs due to one's own lack of ability and this is very important we ascribe the responsibility to ourselves rather than to somebody else or as something she even deserves sometimes we even say that this is what we deserve and we are like you know anything which we do will be bound to fail now a bound to fail can be both forward looking when you are like when you do not even engage in an action you say like you know if i want to say try to be an engineer or like you know we are in the it city so i i can just say okay like you know i cannot make a good engineer any effort i try to do is bound to fail so i'll not even engage in that act or like you know there could be like uh, the other case of a backward looking which is like i engage in that activity but in the process i realize that maybe i am not good enough but this is what i realize at at an individual level but it might be because of the way the interaction happen in the institutions as as we know of a lot of cases at least in india with with students coming from marginalized communities like dalit communities tribal communities or even women like when they enter into educational institutions or like the huge cases of suicide which we are talking in iits or it's sometimes it's because of prejudice like they do not feel welcome in in those spaces now so it can be both forward looking as well as backward looking now um, so but it it has to be uh, remembered and that's our point that back, bound to fail is a is um, has a distinctive social source it is not individual it can be individual but that does not raise concerns of justice when it is when we think it's it's autonomous but it has a distinctive social source because the consequences of the disadvantage in the access to opportunities required to achieve a plan um, goal which they misrecognize and which is which is in the power of the person to retain or dismiss so that's the that's the basic idea now um, now we basically like you know in in the con uh, we recognize three forms there are three epistemic features which characterize a bound to fail attitude one if the first could be misrecognition or it could be uncertainty or a lack or it can create a lack of intellectual self trust so what is misrecognition in in the condition of misrecognition what we do as i mentioned before we misrecognize the sources of our failure we we blame ourselves we we tend to think that the source of failure or, self, or source of wrong is ourselves rather than uh, but but that failure might actually be due to a distinct social prejudice now why this happens this might happen that you know there is a certain kind of intentional withdrawing of of information and the person does not have the complete picture in place when they are taking this decision of or when they are actually assessing their failure so imagine if you if you apply to an institute which is like structurally prejudiced and you come from a marginalized community you might actually think that your failure was because of your own lack of effort but the info, the crucial information you don't have is there might be certain committee members which might be prejudiced so this so it might actually lead to a certain kind of misrecognition or uh, uh, about the sources of those failures and and this might specially be the case when when we are talking about institutions of reputation because like it seems that at least in the collective economy of like uh, our resources or like you know in our collective uh, mindset we think that these institutions are especially institutions of repute which which generally do not discriminate among people like when we there was huge uproar about iits but like you know because we think that iits maybe are like you know this holy institutions which are like institutions of repute so when you question those kind of institutions you first maybe point out to yourself that maybe it's i who am who am wrong so uh, when or even uh, uh, and the second case is like that of uncertainty now why is uncertainty important uncertainty is important in the case and this is more from the uh, uh, side of say the institutions if generally say if an institution or an employer does not want to discriminate is very egalitarian and wants to take uh, like person say based on the merit but but the person does not have uh, complete access to um, all sorts of information that is required to make uh, so uh, 
make a judgment. Say like two people apply, like, and the example we give in the paper is, is like, say two people are applying to a philosophy job in, in, U, in United States Academy, and it's like generally the case, it's observed people from, who are from the United, who have a PhD from US might get a preference over somebody else. But this generally might be, even if there is no prejudice in selection and the person actually wants to select on merit, but it might be that they, they select on a certain base uh, profile because they understand how the academia works in US, but they do not understand, say, how the academia works in India, for example, or how the academia works. So in that case, it might not be, the decision might not be made on the basis of merit, but it is based on the profile you belong to. So even if the outcome of the decision might be correct, but the decision, the procedure of the decision was based on a certain kind of profiling or a certain kind of tracking of the profile of the person. And then you are fit into the profile rather than treated as a different person, flesh and blood. Now this creates, uh, mm, so basically this is the problem of, uh, but what does bound to fail attitude does? It can create a, a form of lack of intellectual self-trust that you might start doubting yourself. If, if for who you are as a person who is a knowledge creator as well as a receiver, like you might start doubting your own abilities. You might think that you are not good enough because your, your efforts are not being recognized by other, others. And this creates a certain kind of problems where we, like, where we lose confidence or we think that you know, we are not mm, good enough at that level. So now, uh, what does this do? So, um, just to conclude on this part before I hand over to Daniele to talk about the significance of choice. So, bound to fail attitude thus results in a process of self-exclusion where failure seems inevitable. At the outset, self-exclusion appeared to be the consequence of an autonomous choice, but at a closer uh, scrutiny, and this is very important, it seems to be, appears to be a consequence of an autonomous choice, but at a closer scrutiny is a product of the internalized attitude of failure that results in the dropout from education system or dropout from resources that we might reasonably be expected to uh, participate in. And then uh, Daniela will talk about the significance of choice. I think we'll have time. Okay, so um, just a little, just a little recap. So we started with the idea that there's some data that show uh, interesting correlation between um, income inequality and also um, what we might call educational inequalities. And we say there are two ways in which we can actually um, say explain it just reduce any sort of inequality to some form of income inequality or material inequality, resource inequality, but actually take you know, uh, seriously the idea that there are forms of inequality that can't just be reduced to, um, say, quantitative aspect. How to deal with that? And we say maybe we need to look at moral psychology of justice, the way in which uh, the way institutions treat people affect the attitudes that people develop with regard to those institutions. So some of these attitudes, we say, are self-exclusionary attitudes. So our project was, is to say, well, in order to grasp, understand what is, how these self-exclusionary attitudes work, we need to work, we need to look at the conditions of injustice that lurk in the background. And we identify mainly some aspect of this epistemic injustice Manuel has been talking about, and focus our attention on a specific kind of self-exclusionary attitudes, which are the bound to fail attitudes. The interesting aspect, as Manuel was saying, about the uh, self-bound uh, to fail attitudes is not that um, there are cases of, say, adaptive preferences, uh, in the sense that uh, something people are unaware of. When I'm bound to fail, I know that whatever thing I do in the end will not make difference with regard to my life prospect. In that sense, people are bound to fail. Now, what is the significance of all this for the project we have about, say, uh, the, the justice dimension of this uh, aspect? And we think there is a, a problem that is, uh, is connected or is attached with the idea, very idea of a choice. We call it the significance of choice. Bound to fail attitudes are a concern of justice in our understanding because the cause of these internalized attitudes cannot primarily ascribe to a non-deceptive and autonomous choice of self-exclusion. The condition, in fact, under which a choice of self-exclusion is made is itself impaired by epistemic conditions for that conditions due to factors that are outside the control 
of the self-executed person, and for that reason, that person bears no responsibility with regard to outcomes of those choices. So we think that absent the provision of ex-ante quality in epistemic resources, any choice that enforces conditions of impairment cannot be ascribed to the chooser. And in that sense, there is a concern of justice. Now, notice that uh, bound to fail attitudes are actually a very human response that people have to lack of control over their ability to pursue their life plans. In a way, what we want to say is that when bound to fail attitudes impinge on people, they impinge on the very ability to give value to the choices they make, not just to the fact that they make choices. So there's a basic distinction that we want to draw in which we actually need to uh, write, uh, sorry, to specify, <laughs> even write, I would say, uh, and if it is the following. One thing is to be affected in terms of injustice when the range or the set of your choices are restricted due to factors of interference. Another is the way in which injustice impinge on people because they deprive them of the value of their value of making choices, or the value of uh, say, attached to the capacity of making choices in general. In that sense, we think that when this is the case for the person, there is a, the, a sort of erosion or the distinction between what happens to be a matter of luck to their life and what is a matter and uh, what is a consequence of their choice. Or to put it better, our choices, uh, say, uh, bountiful attitudes undermine the value that you attach to our choices by eroding the distinction between what is a matter of luck and what is a consequence of our choices, and thereby the significance, I will say, that we attach to ability of making choices in general. We think that when choices lose their significance, because making a choice does not make the difference in our chances to achieve our goals, the very capacity of making this choice loses its value, no matter whether say, a restricted number of choices is still left to us. And if you want to have an idea of what we have in mind, we may think of some sort of a conception of autonomy that comes in a sort of two-play two -play conception, in which we have two levels indeed. One is the value attached to the capacity of making choices in general, and other is the capacity of making voluntary choices in particular. What we said in the beginning, in a way, comes back. Bound to fail attitudes, self-exclusionary choices, are not involuntary, indeed, but they are not the very concern of justice. The very concern of justice, from an epistemic point of view, we should say, consists in, uh, say, impingence on the first level, on the value attached to the capacity of making choices, because those choices will make a difference, a change, a difference in one's life. Now. Um, of course, we are talking about educational opportunities, and we say a little bit, uh, very little about this. So I'll just leave uh, Manoir, uh, say, uh, the, uh, the task of linking what we say to the matter of educational opportunities. Yeah, I'll just, uh, like, just, and this will be the, uh, before we conclude, we talk about, like, how does this all relate to educational opportunities that we are talking about? Now, let's just take three, uh, three uh, cases, like three instances, like where, uh, I take three examples here. One might be the case of adaptive preference, where you might, wa uh, where you do, do have access to individual, where an individual does have access to uh, educational opportunities, but might uh, adapt her preference in the sense that while bound to fail attitudes are not adaptive preferences, they can lead to adaptive preferences. So say, imagine like, you know, I want to study philosophy and I want to become a philosopher, for example. But if the educational system, like, you know, as, as it used to happen earlier, like say, if, if somebody belonging to a lower caste wants to become, say, a scholar in Sanskrit and the teacher just does not think that a person belonging to a lower caste or is, uh, is prejudicial, then then you cannot actually in those cases you might develop these attitudes know that you know like you are not good enough so you might adapt your preference to do something else like you know it just happens all the while in our own context where we are said that certain like certain task divisions are not meant for certain people or like you know this so there is a collective prejudice and a collective discrimination which is going on so there might be certain kind of adaptive preference there or there might just be other cases of just dropout where you 
engage in the educational system for a bit like you know it might be at the school level or it might be like you drop out say at a higher educational level which like people like Bordeaux said that there is only a limit where uh, after which you start excluding yourself so sometimes it might be starting at school sometimes it might just go where you think that you know because he says failure seems to be inevitable in the end so if you take that kind of example there might be dropout say at the higher education level or there is a complete self exclusion that you don't think that you know anything is going to make any difference if you engage in uh, in the education system itself like as used to happen like uh, with a lot of examples which we see either uh, of uh, people belong to lower class uh, studies we have seen in England or even in India like you know people say oh what will happen if they get educated anyways they have to get into the same kind of employment so these kind of now how does it relate so basically generally when we talk about like the aims and purposes of education we say like generally a democratic provision of education should inculcate reflective and critical attitudes and and develop an ability to understand the sources of injustice when we say like you know we understand we teach sociology in schools or we, we talk about exclusion marginalization we say that you know students should be aware of their own social standing and what are the sources of oppression and marginalization so like they should be able to understand themselves what are the sources of injustice and reflect the conditions grounding their own choices so become a reflective in individual in general so like education system generally should make people autonomous if you are like you know if or if you want to take a very minimalist view at least uh, like if that is too perfectionist for you you can just say at least at a minimal level to provide the capacity to of appreciating and making choices in general but like what actually if, if we see the first two instances here of adaptive preferences and dropouts it might actually see that you know that if this is still continuing as we saw the data of miles korak it might seem that there's at education system like the democratic provision of education is actu actually failing in certain regards though um, uh, in terms of like people might still misrecognize uh, those sources of injustice or or like you know the third instance which represents the problem of choice in general in a society governed by prejudice so that is like a general form of injustice and uh, just to conclude like uh, to s that bound to fail attitudes are a concern of justice then because they affect people's capacity of valuing choices in general although they do not affect their capacity of making particular voluntary choices there are consequences of framing that is unjustified from the point of view of choice not of voluntary conduct and what we think in conclusion just to say something which we don't really discuss so much here that from a normative point of view only a relational conception of egalitarian can properly Mm, uh, frame the problem of like self uh, defeat uh, self defeating attitudes as a concern of justice because only within such a framework self respect is due to everyone in virtue of their equal status as persons thank you thank you both of you so dani ala and manohar uh, you actually have 5 minutes uh, more for discussion so we have 15 minutes for discussion we have to close at 4 five and uh, actually the whole discussion is working in tandem since morning i didn't use this vocabulary in my own presentation but the vocabulary was there at the back of my partly because i was under the impression gandhi who thought that the, why do you want to borrow why do you want to shop in seconds that's it so you have your own original vocabulary so i was following gandhi in the morning and so i didn't use any vocabulary I, though and if i am a follower of kant i why would i really require any additional support to really boost up my self respect because respect is unconditional you have to enjoy respect without any conditionalities so why do you require support banister as hana arun said why do you require banisters you don't require banister so that is one challenge uh, and gandhi won't require banisters anyway uh, and so that's one uh, one uh, quick comment the other comment is about uh, a quick comment is about the harumanatic and epistemic injustice uh, i mean why do you want to insulate institutions from human beings i mean human beings are i mean logically all structures are empty of power 
they become powerful, powerless, depending on who's occupying those structures. PM's office is very, very powerful because somebody is occupying that. Very, very, completely. So, I mean, I, it will be a fallacy to separate institutions from power, power acting. So, uh, as if, you know, in, in individuals, in, in, uh, for example, I am not involved in uh, 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 violence or any kind of communal rights. It is the structure. That would be a fallacy. So, injustice is being done both by, primarily by human interests with the help of structures that are actually created by human beings at the first instance. Therefore, hierarchy institutions, education institutions, all that institution themselves structures and this hall doesn't have any power. It's empty of power. It becomes powerful because we are all sitting here, powerful people. And that's it. And so we'll have some discussion on this now. Uh, thank you very much. One, Robbie, then uh, quick, w one, two, three, four, first. And then five, uh, Roiji, five, and then six. Uh, huge time for you. Uh, would you please pass on the mic? Oh, oh, oh here, here. Ah, he has that. Okay. You can take this as well. This is working. This, this mic is working. Efficient mic. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Manohar and Daniele, for this wonderful presentation. I had just uh, one comment, probably, and if you want, you can respond to these questions because when you were saying this a statement that bound to fail is a social attitude, or you said that social exclusion is a a structural act. I don't know why, but I was just repeatedly being reminded of one, the classic statement of Durkheim, he says that suicide is a social act. And suicide is not an individual act, suicide is a social act. And these two statements that you were making that very similar to what Durkheim was saying 100 years ago and then said. So just the, the question that I'm asking is that another thing that came across the presentation was that probably exclusion is equal to injustice. And I don't know because uh, can be reduced in concept of injustice to mere exclusion because that's what and then how does it fit into the entire scheme of recognition and distributional, distributional uh, uh, project of justice. And then the second question that I have is and probably this is more a comment because probably this comment is also emerging from my observation that this entire argument so, seems to be more sociological than political philosophy. So in that sense, I'm just asking this question that then what is the normative claim that one could make out of this presentation? And I'm just trying to make this normative claim that probably the enabling conditions for justice in this context, context is probably the, egalitarian, the possibility of egalitarian movements. In that case, because see the problem is that I'm just taking one minute more time. Because, this, when, because the distinction between social attitude and individual propensity, when these two concepts get blurred, then what happens is that then actually probably we lose the sight that there is a social group which is kind of always fighting for the egalitarian moments. That is the possibility of justice. So I would just seek comment on this. Thank, Thank you. you so much.
destroys itself and is dharma one of those kinds of structures because inside dharma you don't have choice you have you can either do dharma or not do dharma so the whole idea of dharma itself can be relooked at what is choice within dharma what is choice of uh, because the dharma conflict and uh, dharmic dilemma and conflict right so that kind of self defeating purpose kind of repeats itself in the trope of dharma which which is very difficult why i cannot use dharma directly as an ethical uh, construct inside the current contemporary uh, indian social justice problem so these are three points thank you thank you mera for that as a different spin on the Can question I say something? yes yes okay i just uh, i mean you seem to suggest uh, a very interesting analysis that a self exclusionary attitude is something that arises out of structured prejudice Uh, the danger i find in looking at self exclusionary attitude and giving it i mean the kind of uh, very nuanced understanding that you've given is very interesting but i find a danger in this because there's a possibility of looking at this as an individual condition and missing the point that actually it is structured prejudice which gets conveyed structurally through institutionalized mechanisms so i'm just trying to see you know the argument can be actually used to justify self exclusionary attitudes as individual conditions so maybe what i'm trying to suggest here is that you could perhaps delve deeper into how the structured prejudice actually gets conveyed through what kind of structural mechanisms that is where we will need to do a little more sort of uh, deeper analysis thank you thank you punam i i, I hope i am not missing the order rohit are uh, you are no. there in the bin huh oh, you are missed sorry uh, rohit in sab pehle aap kar rahe hain nahi nahi kare aap he can surrender his plane on in your favor please ha but will surrender it in acharya ha as uh, good presentation but uh, you are talking about the self defeating self exclusionary tendencies and they are due to the internalization of the dominant cultural uh, ideology or we can say dominant cultural concepts this internalization of dominant cultural concepts is a problem for the education itself so this is the reality we can say but what are the educational uh, methods through which we can address to this problem istwan mazaras i think uh, he is a political philosopher also he has discussed something about the counter consciousness or counter internalization so this counter consciousness or counter internalization is something which education needs to address i think thank you uh, now i have four people in front of me uh, rohit ji sebastian my friend uh, 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 from uh, germany and apar finally that's it uh, we just can't go beyond this four. rohit ji and then sebastian okay. and then you in the interest of time i'll just ask one small question and a very direct one uh, it seems i did not understand the idea of hermeneutic injustice uh, if you say that hermeneutic injustice uh, is as a case when the person on whom injustice is perpetuated does not have the conceptual repertoire to understand his or her experience and articulate it then i understand it but if you say that the conceptual apparatus is absent on both the sides on the perpetrator as well as the person who is the target of injustice then it seems to me that justice is not name of a situation it's an evaluative term and like beauty it seems justice lies in the eyes of the beholder so whose eye is looking at that injustice at that time is it the third eye god's eye of a researcher's eye if you are say that then i think most of history we will discard as it's a series of injustices so there seems to be a problem in this extended concept of hermeneutic injustice very good sebastian and yeah. then quick sebastian and then uh, you want to take it take yeah. a chance 
Yeah, yes, yes. Sebastian, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my, my question is somehow related with this one because one of the features you mentioned uh, about uh, hermeneutical injustice is that it is actually there is nobody to be blamed in the in, in, when it takes it, 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 it takes place. But then, uh, with the examples you were giving uh, about, for instance, the, the, the person who is applying for a job in the United States and then they only take people from, from the, their own community, well, it seems that you can make a case and say, well, that practice they are, they, they are doing, those institutions, well, that's unjust because they are not taking in consideration that they now live in a world which is, I don't know, globalized and they receive applications from all around the world, so they should have they should take the time to revise all the applications in a fair way or something like that, or, or if the decision is made in a biased way or prejudice, well, you cannot also make the case and say, well, this is unjust, you shouldn't do that, and the responsibility would be in, in the, on the side of the, on the institution. So I, I wonder if that would be also a case of uh, hermeneutical injustice. Thank you. Professor Krasmiri, you can make a point. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to try just two, for, uh, two uh, very small points. Uh, uh, I found uh, particularly valuable in your paper this distinction between two different types of choice. Uh, but I'm not uh, quite sure uh, whether or not you have the proper designation for these two types of choice. So you are distinguished between what you call general choice and voluntary choice. Uh, I would suggest uh, this uh, designation like voluntaristic choice probably for the, uh, for the last one uh, or contingent choice and informed choice for the first one. But this is only a spontaneous uh, uh, informed choice probably. Uh, and then uh, the, second, uh, the second small point uh, is go together with uh, a little bit at least with uh, what uh, Rohit also said. Uh, I'm wondering whether you are not uh, mixing uh, psychology, moral psychology, with epistemology, because uh, it, what we have described as a uh, attitude of be bound to fail is a kind of lacking of self-confidence and not that much lacking of knowledge, of self-knowledge. And by talking about hermeneutical injustice uh, in, the, in terms of Africa, actually in that situation you have the hermeneutical resources to describe your situation. But we are not making use of these resources because uh, of lack probably of self-respect or self-confidence, which is not an epistemological issue, but a rather psychological, psychological one. Okay. Thank you. Apar? Yeah, uh, just if I understood you correctly, uh, at the end you made this analogy between luck and the choice of self-exclusion. And I was wondering if that was ontologically uh, suspect. Uh, uh, luck could be a matter of where I'm born, but uh, even if uh, I exclude myself and it's a choice and it might not be an autonomous choice, it's still in some sense a choice. So I was wondering if this particular analogy uh, could sort of holds water. So that's, that's the question. Both of you want to answer? Of course, two minutes each. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 Um, um, yeah. okay. So, um, should we go by? <laughs> you nearly forgot that. No, thank you for um, um So, the first one was about Rabi. Now, I totally take the idea about Durkheim, which I know very well, but uh, you actually uh, say, if I <laughs> um, remember it well, understood you well, you, you raised two main points. The first one is, well, you should say clearly that exclusion equals a form of injustice. And the second point you're making is say, well, uh, in order to say that, you need a normative claim, which, you know, in a way uh, needs to have some sort of, you know, normative framework, which uh, extends uh, beyond, say, the mere moral psychology of um, that we are describing. Um, I totally take it. What I would say is the following. Not all forms of exclusions, I think, are form of um, injustice. In the following sense, uh, it's more in general something that has been voiced also uh, before by some other, uh, um, say, um, uh, questions. Uh, some form of individual or group ex self-exclusions might be totally justified because uh, 
both individuals and, in my opinion, individuals and groups have, um, say, the freedom of deciding who to associate themselves with or disassociate themselves with. And I think there are cases in which this is something sort of a right that we should recognize. The case in which forms of self-exclusions are a concern of justice are cases when that kind of uh, choice uh, is not in the control of the subjects of, uh, 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 of uh, those who decide whether to associate or disassociate themselves. So that's the fundamental, uh, say, idea. Now, uh, in the kind of work we're trying to do is to distinguish between forms of legitimate exclusion, let's say, um, from forms of illegitimate ones, uh, or illegitimate exclusion. And mainly, I mean, the idea of the paper is to say, we need to look at both two things, where the people have a proper, say, a capacity of exercising a choice in that, in that sense, and second is whether actually some attitudes that are, in a way, reflect how people are treated, lead them to self-exclude themselves in a way in which they would not have done it if conditions were different. And I think that from that point of view, the role of institutions is important. So to put it in a different way, one thing is to decide whether to associate as a person to, one, to someone else. Um, let's say, I can make even an example and say, for a son to decide, say, for a member of fam uh, for a member of family to decide to dissociate himself completely, say, from the family, and you want to grant that possibility, of course, and being actually not entitled to inheritance in virtue of the fact that he dissociated himself. I think that by making that choice, if we can say that it's an autonomous choice, and then you're not entitled to inheritance, then is not a concern of justice. It is a concern of justice when the choice of self-exclusion can be traced back to the way in which that person has been treated by, by, uh, by his family. And if there is a way in which that person has been treated badly, been offended, been treated unfairly, or discriminated in a way, then of course we have a concern of justice. Only in that case, I would say that cases of exclusion are a case of injustice. And only in that case, I would say normative principles of fairness and maybe compensation should apply. So that's the first question. As with the second one, and then I will, the three uh, by Nira, three main points, which is a very interesting one. I don't know about motivational theory. I was working about this a little bit, but I don't know about, uh, in cases of relative deprivation, are very interesting ones. And uh, I would like to hear more about this. And so, um, but the point you make is about the idea that whether a structure should already be in place in order to make any claim about uh, epistemic injustice. I would say yes, but in the following way. Uh, I can say from some sort of, um, maybe I would say, um, uh, uh, philosophical formation, which the idea that there are structures is suspicious sometimes. In the sense that uh, I'm, uh, I have the suspicion that uh, any time we make in claim about the existence of a structure, we can substantiate it only if we can refer it to people acting in a certain way. There are no unintentional structure. If there is something like a structure, that is a claim that should be properly translated in terms of attitudes people voluntarily, well intentionally, sometimes unintentionally might be, but the attitudes that people take and actions that fall on their off. And when this is the case, yes, Definitely. In fact, one of the claims was the idea that the dimension of moral psychology of justice is what happens with people when they're treated unfairly by institutions. Institutions, what are institutions? A scheme of rules. They are. But the way in which rules are applied, maybe in many ways, sometimes rules are inherently unjust, discriminatory. Sometimes maybe formally just. The rule of law is wonderful in that regard in many times. But people can be treated unfairly in within a just or say a formally uh, just system. So uh, the way in which those rules and people applying those rules or acting upon those rules interact is what I would call a structure in that sense. And of course cases of epistemic injustice would call both into account, both the scheme, the rules, and the people that, uh, I'd say, comply or act upon those rules. Uh, last point about Dharma, uh, I, I, I don't know, I would love to uh, 
uh, yeah, know something about this. Uh, there's one thing about the idea of a choice that I was trying to make is this idea that, uh, uh, yeah, there's a point in which choice counts, I think, in the end, because it does boil down to uh, the kind of choice we make are choices for which we can claim some form of authorship. Uh, any, say, language regarding, I'm not talking about the Dharma here, but the idea that choice doesn't count because in the end, uh, the order of things is stronger than whatever kind of choice we make, might be true in general, but it's not true with regard to people that can fulfill their life plans. Vis-a-vis -vis people for which whatever choice they make, they cannot fulfill their life plans. In that case, I would say, people that cannot fulfill their life plans because their choices don't count, are people that are deprived of their capacity of choice. But maybe in the great order of things, maybe uh, really doesn't make any sense. But that, in that regard, you know, political philosophy is not about the ultimate uh, metaphysical destiny, but uh, people in flesh and blood. Okay. Oh, you don't want to address Oh, all of them? Good. Uh, that's, I think you are, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, there was the last one, yes, about the idea of luck and uh, self-choice uh, or self-exclusion. Uh, so an example that I would make, I don't know who is, oh, here. Uh, in a way, I think that uh, we can make choices in many ways. I have a friend that at one point, he said that he made his most important choices in life by just uh, tossing a coin or actually launching the dice. They can be actually a choice that you make. In a way, actually, you delegate your choice in a way to something else, to you know, some form of luck. And what I want to say is that the aspect concerning significance of choice is exactly whether it makes a difference for you, the fact that you decide to stick with a plan, or if you leave to toss into a coin, decide on your, on your behalf. Uh, we may say in that case, you're still acting and making a choice, but it's insignificant because you're leaving, say, the burden of taking the consequences of letting your life plan be decided by something which is outside your control. Uh, in that sense, I would say, yes, you're making a choice. But it's a choice which is quite uh, random, so to speak. Uh, the real choice that counts, I think, for people's life is when uh, choices people make also comes with the idea that uh, it's good for us that we make choices. It says something about who we are, our identity, personality, and also our place you know, in, uh, uh, in the world, so to speak. So in that sense, we attach value to it. It might be the case, right, that we're making a choice even when they are not count in this very minimal sense, but they're not significant ones. Okay, okay I'll just... Uh... I'll just take two minutes, yeah, I'll just take two minutes to, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. I'll just, uh, yeah, about Professor Poonam's question about, you're right, uh, maybe we have just not like, you know, uh, we have to uh, work through what are those institutional mechanism, mechanisms because we might end up conflating cases of where there might be, and that's what we say, that there might be cases where there is a genuine case of self-exclusion which might be autonomous and those that actually result from a structural prejudice. So we need to like really work through those uh, mechanisms through which structures actually affect or structural prejudices affect individuals' capacities of choice. And I think that work needs to be done in this paper. It's just at a very early stage of the draft. And so thank you for that comment. I think it's... Uh, about uh, uh, Professor Acharya's uh, uh, comment here, yeah, uh, I completely agree with you. I think there is, we, we don't really, um, because I think there is um, important work and something which Krashimir was also mentioning that, you know, in the, how do we, and I think on this philosophers of education say much more better than what we can because we really don't have expertise on this about how should we organize the classroom, what kind of curriculum should be taught, like you know how should we engage with communities. So there needs to be a process of like counter internalization or like what even say Gram should say counter hegemony, I don't know like so there has to be those, so we'll, uh, we completely buy that argument that yes maybe one of the normative ways of looking at it like you know we just we in the end just end up saying, okay, educational system is not providing maybe those capacities. But maybe one of the ways with, through which a democratic provision of education might 
help in understanding these injustices because we are saying this is more at an individual level we are talking about the moral psychology so yeah like maybe a better or a uh, democratically organized education system might actually work towards solving most of these problems but at the same level saying that because most of these prejudices are not only entering through the education system but at society as large sometimes it starts at your ch childhood like you know beginning of and you internalize those attitudes like at the very start even before you enter the school system or education system so it might just be replicated so so yeah but uh, completely right and about rohit ji you're right like there is this there is this evaluative term but like this is what miranda uh, fricker like it's it's just the term we borrowed from her but but there is but she also mentions and just a clarification she mentions that it's not true that there is no injustice done there is an injustice done so it's not completely evaluative there, but but the problem is she says that the oppressed feels that they have been wrong but they do not have the complete conceptual resource to express that wrong like how should we express what is this wrong and how do i distinct distinguish this wrong from other forms of wrong and so to seek a redress when you cannot conceptually explain something it, it might be a bit difficult and that's why like something uh, um, for fricker then it means that we have to be more patient with the with somebody who is trying to explain her own condition and be like uh, be more empathetic and actually give a better hearing uh, to that case and uh, just uh, about uh, yeah uh, just uh, about krasimir last last point and sebastian yeah sebastian yeah i think it might be a case of hermeneutical injustice but we need to discuss it i think we we can take it outside and krasimir just uh, last point about are we mixing psychology with epistemology i don't think so because what we are saying is our bound to fail attitude might be like you know where we saying you might have those hermeneutical resources but you do not interpret your own condition as being resulting from a prejudice so there is a certain kind of like lack of self knowledge if you like it or like you know lack of those interpreted resources and that is because of either misrecognition or because like certain forms of information which should be available to you has been actually not given to you like the information of that you you did not qualify for an exam because of a prejudice now if that creates a bound to fail attitude it's not because of your own lack of self respect or like you know lack of confidence but because of a certain epistemic condition which is lack of knowledge and then you create these attitudes so that's it yeah thanks a lot thank you organizers put me into a very difficult situation we are already for 20 minutes late and uh, uh, two in one is always a problem so uh, they should both of them should take blame of over shooting by 20 minutes uh -huh. i apologize rohit for this over shooting we we'll break for tea with the permission of the organizer thank you very much yeah, we all the three panelists and, uh, We, yeah. tr we should try to come back here in the next 15 minutes for the last uh, pay, uh, presentation of the day. Thank you.